Hi, everyone. It's uh, Mo Bhandari from Orthopod. I welcome today uh, Dr. John Antonio. He is Professor and Research Director in the Department of Surgery at McGill University and also a past president of the Canadian uh, Orthopedic Association. And we're here chatting today with him to get his insights on this whole um, movement towards reopening uh, elective procedures and specifically to get his insights on resuming elective uh, orthopedic surgery. John, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Mo. Um, this is obviously a topic that's uh, top of mind amongst uh, many of the orthopedic surgeons across, across the country, uh, particularly in sort of more um, harshly affected areas. I, I think uh, areas that have been spared the brunt of this, uh, the transition to um, uh, ramping up and elective care, as we've already seen in uh, Manitoba and Alberta, uh, maybe a bit more seamless, uh, where there might not be a prioritization, but just more of a ramping up of all elective and non-elective surgeries. Um, whereas other parts of the country, uh, people are looking at a, a more of a triage process that's going on. Certainly in Quebec, where I'm at, uh, this is what's happening. And, and unfortunately, when it comes to that, um, orthopedics uh, in many uh, people's minds is relegated as... Uh, uh, sort of bottom of the list type situation, um, the, you know, and unfortunately, uh, the ironic part about it is, is that uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, orthopedics uh, patients were faced with the longest wait times of among all the uh, surgical subspecialties. Uh, and unfortunately, this has just gotten uh, exponentially worse uh, with uh, the complete halting of all elective surgery. And so I think that um, the COA and, um, I mean, orthopedic surgeons in, in general, surgeon champions uh, in the various uh, provincial, uh, you know, uh, sub, uh, specialty associations and uh, provincial health care departments uh, should, uh, should be out there advocating for the orthopedic patients that are, that are suffering quietly, um, some not so quietly, uh, and are going to suffer further by the fact that we are going to be um, uh, delayed even further in certain certain provinces where the ramping up might not be prioritizing elective care. So can I ask you, uh, John, when you think about the how long this reopening process will go, so I guess the first question is, do you think we're ever going to get to a hundred percent of where we were before COVID-19? So in other words, is our new ceiling 90 percent of where we were over the next year or so? And quite frankly, how long do you think this could last? You know, I mean, I think I think it's it's a guess. Um, you know, and also, I think it also depends on who's running your institution and mm -hmm. and how um, how things are set up. You know, I think unfortunately, uh, we'll have to reevaluate this afterwards when this is all sure. said and done, and right. hindsight will be a very important uh, guide for us. But there are some people who um, I think of Joanne Liu, who was uh, uh, the head of Médecins Sans Frontières. Right. Doctors Without Borders, who has right. faced uh, uh, things like uh, Ebola um, right. and uh, MERS and SARS um, and uh, you know various other sort of epidemics uh, around the world. And one of the first things she mentioned, which unfortunately we haven't necessarily done here in Canada, is, is the importance of isolating uh, these patients in their own um, setting, in their own environment, uh, potentially even in their own institution. Um, and not necessarily mixing it with the with our general hospital population, because the unintended consequence of that is that, um, you know, just as in our institution, uh, our ICUs are actually not very busy. Our mm -hmm. emergency rooms, of course, are not busy because people are afraid, but our hospital beds are overwhelmed with um, what we call level three, level four care patients who... I mean, they need some care, of course, but in many cases, it's more palliative than otherwise. And right. so by the time we clear those patients out, uh, we are not going to be anywhere near 100%. Now, as far as the new normal, whether we're going to be uh, at 90 or 100%, you know, I'm just worried about getting to 90. I mean, uh, yeah. the 90 to 100%, I think, comes down to uh, whether we are able to uh, work effectively while protecting ourselves in an area, you know, in a time where... We haven't had uh, sort of full immunity and, and the virus is still around. I'm hoping, you know, and of course, I tend to be an optimist that uh, as we see in many parts of the world, there is a first wave. We haven't seen a huge second wave yet, even in countries that have started to open up. And I'm hoping that this is a, 
the kind of pandemic where uh, there's a high, you know, uh, infection, much much higher infection rate than we think, and potentially some kind of an immunity that will ultimately prevent uh, this massive, this dreaded massive second wave. Because the unintended, unintended consequence of, of of fearing the massive second wave is that you're you're creating huge other uh, epidemics of massive wait lists and uh, unmet needs for patients with a lot of chronic conditions that's just getting worse by the day. Well, you know, I, I think your, uh, first of all, you think your assertion that we aren't measuring infections uh, accurately is, I think, probably um, a very valid statement. We, we've had some uh, folks on podcasts here, Sash Vade, for example, is a data scientist at McMaster University who absolutely believes, uh, using some of his modeling, um, that we are grossly under uh, calling the number of infections. And just as you uh, suggest, there's many more people who have it, and simply because we haven't tested enough and we haven't done what Australia's done uh, in talking to Rebecca Ivers recently. She said that they were really vigilant on contact tracing. So someone got it, they found it, and they found everyone that person that touched or interacted with to capture those individuals early and try to uh, contain the virus. But let me ask you this. So the argument could be that, well, um, many, many of the uh, elective patients in the orthopedic surgical community um, may have chronic chronic issues, um, but they aren't life-threatening issues. Can you speak to at all what some of the risks might be of someone who may have a chronic issue, although it may not lead to um, the surgery itself, um, or they're not going to die if they don't have the surgery, for example, but what are some of the other unintended consequences that might be happening in our patients that we really should be more uh, attuned to? Well, uh, that, that's 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 my point. Unfortunately, I think you know we can't be looking at uh, prioritizing a life-saving and forgetting about uh, other chronic conditions. Uh, you know, my, I'm I'm advocating for dealing with both. And as you mentioned, you know the uh, the the effects may not be apparent to some off the bat, but we have an ongoing opioid crisis, which is only getting worse with people trying to deal uh, with the, this, this prolonged, chronic, worsening, painful situation that's occurring with our the lack of access to uh, our very effective surgical interventions. Uh, there's also with that, the exacerbation of mental health conditions, uh, the worsening of other comorbid uh, conditions due to inactivity. And ultimately, we do also treat a huge part of the workforce and there's you know, prolonged disability and a lack of productivity, which results in even more of this vicious circle of uh, mental health, uh, mm -hmm. keeping people in a lower, you know, in, in poor social economic situation. I mean, these are things that, you know, you may not be able to count in terms of the number of deaths but that have sort of immeasurable consequences to our society in general. And I think that just saying that, oh, we, uh, we can just deal with this, keep these patients in the hospital, keep everybody happy, keep our death numbers down in the level four uh, patients as long as we can, patients who ultimately, of course, will end up dying, uh, you know, unfortunately, given their, their underlying situation, and yet having the unintended consequence of creating this this behemoth of a problem uh, on the back end. And, uh, it, you know, I think canceling uh, care now is not the answer. I think that, that I think we have to think out in a way that, you know, maybe making our system different, maybe isolating these people, putting them in, in, a, in a different environment, maybe, maybe uh, designating certain centers as cold centers and really ramping up the surgical care and the elective care there. Maybe thinking that outside of the uh, you know box of you know eight to three surgical care, but maybe running ORs into the night, um, bringing in teams from the uh, hot hospitals and bringing in their patients and wait lists into the cold hospitals. I mean, these are ideas that you do in a time where you don't want to leave. You know, I, I think I think canceling care or deferring care is a failure. It's it's not it's not a uh, a viable alternative that we should be automatically you know jumping to in, in, in times like this. And I think that that's going to be borne out when we look at this in hindsight later on. Well, let me ask this, and maybe it's maybe my final point uh, to you, and um, is if we don't act now or we don't act in the, in the ensuing weeks and latest months, um, will we ever be able to catch up when things reopen? I mean, it, does it get to a point where the backlog or the 
unmet need of orthopedics, which was already, quite frankly, um, you know, you could argue in some cases a crisis in some areas because the wait lists were so long. Are we ever going to be able to catch up? And what is that risk? Well, that well that well that's the problem, and I I think that that our our wait lists, you know. Are are the worst in the G7, uh, right. you know, and I think that that we are going to be relegated to further down the list in terms of having, you know, timely access to care. And I think, as you said, uh, there's just not enough. The way our system is set up right now, there's not enough wiggle room to to catch up. I mean, we just we just don't don't have more ORs and more institutions being built and more access to OR time. Uh, that's that I, is I could see in the in the coming you know mo years you know months or years to come. So you know the more you the more of a backlog you create, the worse the suffering is uh, in the background. So I I, <clears throat> I I I'm not very optimistic that we're going to be able to catch up. I just don't I just don't want it to get any worse. And so I think that as as things open up, and of course we take care of our cardiac cases and our uh, our cancer cases. Of course those are important. But it shouldn't be um, at the expense of the patients who are who don't have a voice, uh, which ends up being primarily orthopedic patients. Well, you know, on that note, I can't thank you enough because I think while we often are obviously obviously prioritizing life-saving uh, maneuvers for those who are victims of COVID and also just you know have had serious injuries that cannot be or serious uh, ailments that need urgent treatment, it's good to see that there are champions for those who also. Um, need you know to be uh, reminded you know or, or certainly are reminding um, the rest of the community that we have patients out there um, that need need our advocacy and thank you very much dr antonio for you know being a strong advocate for this issue thanks Mark. thanks for the opportunity